Hello, all. We are just coming out of the lightning talks and getting ready for the Consortium Leaders Interest Group in here. Um, I just want to give a shout out again to our sponsors, Emerald Data Networks, Equinox, Open Library Initiative, and Mobius for being our champion sponsors. Um, I see Ben in here, so I'm going to add him. And Hello. Yeah, sorry, I should have already done such a thing. Uh, yeah, so um, Ruth, anything else in the other sort of orders of business you need to deal with? Not particularly other than to say, um, if you want to be promoted to speak, just kind of throw something into the chat and I we have, 10 spots. I'm here as a moderator as well as participating in this actual uh, session as a consortium leader. Um, so Sharon, I suspect I'm going to go ahead and promote you since I know. And um, Mickey, are you representing Missouri Evergreen as well? Not Katie. And and there's a button in the top right, I believe, of your screen that says um, request to have audio video. So if you're interested in joining the dialogue, then uh, um, that's how to get, that's another way. The other thing that I will say is I'm gonna put a link for our live um, captioning into the chat if you wanna follow along there, All right? Awesome. Um, I'm also going to put a link to the uh, Google Doc that we typically use uh, for um, sort of discussion topics and that sort of thing. So um, if you have any suggestions, of course, you know, uh, participating in the chat uh, as well as you can throw something in there and you can see some of the other things that other people have suggested uh, as discussion topics. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Benjamin Murphy. I'm the NC Cardinal Program Manager. Um, we are a consortium uh, supporting some public libraries in North Carolina, and uh, this is an annual session that we have here at the conference each year for people that lead consortia and work with uh, groups of libraries. Uh, for the last two years or so, we've been connecting on a quarterly basis just for sort of casual conversations about issues that come up, you know, things that we encounter. Um, it's meant to be an opportunity for us to sort of trade notes, kind of see what challenges our colleagues are facing and to sort of learn from each other. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, this is meant to be a roundtable discussion. Uh, so I encourage others of you that want to participate uh, to, uh, you know, uh, join the conversation, whether you want to do it on camera with a mic or in the chat, we'll try to keep an eye on the conversation there and make sure that that's all represented and such. Um, so it's really great to uh, see a lot of familiar faces here um, and some new ones as well. The other thing that I would suggest before we get going is if this is something that uh, is in the scope of what you do for for your position and you're interested in joining us uh, for the quarterly conversations, um, there is a Evergreen mailing list that you can find on the mailing list uh, page for the Evergreen uh, site. And um, that will uh, get you on the list. And then we send out meeting invitations and that sort of thing uh, there on that list. So uh, with that, uh, let's let's get rolling. Um, okay, so there were uh, um, some different uh, conversation topics that were suggested uh, by different folks. Um, let's jump into those. The first one uh, was about patron privacy, and I'll read that for those of you who, uh, thank you, Ruth, for posting that in the chat. Um, uh, CW Mars recently did a privacy audit, and we're looking into developing best practices for multi-type consortia to better protect patron data. We're very interested in what others are doing around student academic patron data, report permissions around exporting patron data, automated purge criteria and schedules, and anonymization of circulation data, and strengthening privacy policies, policies etc. Um, so I guess my first question would be, is there anything to add to that question? And what are y'all doing? Yeah, 
And Jeanette, as somebody here from, are you, how are you approaching it now, even though I suspect it's your question as well? Yeah, we, um, we recent, one of our strategic initiatives this year was to kind of um, revisit uh, our privacy practices and policies. So we did um, hire uh, a consultant, Becky Yost, who actually was the keynote at Evergreen last year, um, to kind of uh, give us, uh, she did some training with our, with our uh, libraries and then also kind of reviewed our current um, practices and areas, you know, in the, particularly a lot of it's in the ILS that um, we, we, could look at. <laughs> so I was just curious if anyone else had gone through some of this process or if you've started or are working at it. I mean, some things that were, were um, you know, that came up obviously were around reports and report permissions around patron data. We're a multi-type consortia. So, um, you know, right now we share the patron record with all the libraries. We uh, sometimes have student IDs in those records. And then, you know, FERPA is crazy complicated <laughs> and um so you know we're just kind of taking a step back and looking at everything and seeing you know everything from where to to our libraries put files <laughs> um to you know how do we um you know who can export data out of reports and all of that and some of it i think what might need some future development but um but yeah, I was just curious where all of you are, if, if it's something that, you know, is on your radar as well. Um, Jeanette, I, I can speak to some of that because we have a lot of the same issues in Sitka here in, in BC, well, Western Canada. We have a multi-type consortium, um, uh, primarily public libraries, but we have uh, an increasing number of post-secondary libraries K to 12 special government and uh, they're in three Canadian provinces. So um, we have a lot of the same issues around uh, privacy. So um, the reporter is a concern um, and it's something that we've looked at. Is there some development that we could do because it is possible for report output to be generated by others or viewed by other libraries um, uh, and there's no way to to fully lock that down so that is a concern so what we have had in place for a number of years is anyone who has access to the reporter has to sign a waiver and they um, have to basically swear that they're not going to access other libraries um, reports they will only look at their own reports but obviously that's on an honor basis um, we have a similar kind of um, uh, privacy pop-up, I guess we call it, uh, on the circulation side. So there's quite a lot of um, mobility in a lot of the population, especially here in British Columbia. So people will use library services at different libraries across the province, depending on where they work, live, play. And um, if they want to, if they go to a library where they haven't borrowed before, the um, library staff will see a, a kind of a what we call a privacy pop up and it tells them they have to ask permission of the uh, person to access their record and then they have to indicate that they've received that permission before they can access their records. So again, it's it's on the honor system, but it's um, those are the pieces that we had to put in place. Um, we do also do some anonymization of CERC records. Um, off the top of my head, I think our business case, and we got some legal um, opinion about how long we could retain um, how long we would uh, need to retain information before anonymizing it. So I think it's three years is considered a reasonable business case, at least here in BC. Um, so those are some of the things that we've done and put in place, but I'm really interested in what others are doing and if there's any, um, if there's been any thinking about developing some walls and barriers, especially on the reporter side to really shut that down, because we do see that as kind of the leakiest part of the, the software from a privacy perspective. 
So Can I ask a little, a little bit about what you do in terms of the anonymization? Is that something where you're using like the age circulation, or are you are you using sort of uh, customized tables, or you know any any um, any sense of what you do? Yeah, I don't know exactly how um, Jeff is doing that. He's developed some scripts um, to look at. Uh, I think, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what he's looking at. So it's it's basically three any circulations that are over three years and don't have any outstanding, um, uh, you know, if there's no fines or fees owing on that transaction, they are then anonymized. And I can't tell you technically how we do that, but if you'd like to know more, I can get that for you. Elizabeth, I think I interrupted you. Uh, I was just gonna say that we, um, we don't, lock down the patron record of a patron is a patron of the state so we don't you know tell each of our libraries that they can't access the record however our big concern is with a library exporting data for the purpose of either communicating with the patron or using their patron data for you know marketing purposes and then sending it to a third-party vendor like orange boy or patron point those types of services um we uh our unit of university system, we're a state agency, and we have a legal team that has designated specifically what we can and cannot do with patron data. It's just that we can't lock that down in Evergreen. So I live in fear that you know somebody's going to export a bunch of patron data to do marketing information, and then it's going to get nabbed somewhere. So if, if there is some interest in locking down <laughs> the reporter, <laughs> I'm, I'm all on board. So. I do think that the reporter was actually more locked down, at least for our consortium, uh, than it is now. Um, and I'm not sure what permission was changed, but I remember when we first um, implemented Evergreen in 2007, 2008, um, it was kind of like a fire hose of information everybody could get if they had, and then um, realized that not so much that people were getting a bunch of information they shouldn't, but they were building templates that broke the system at that point. And so uh, locked those permissions down. And then when there were fixes put in place for that, it seems like those permissions then were um, reapplied. So we have pretty loose, um, looser than I like, uh, ability for just about anybody to at least view um, outputs, which um, is something that is on my radar to go in there and look specifically at those permissions and make them more appropriate to the, um, the people that are accessing that information. And to speak to those third party vendors, and I'm pretty sure that Pines probably does the same thing. We don't we don't allow them um, access to our database. They they get uh, polls that we have defined for them that we exports that we give to them on a regular basis, which is not what they want at all. Of course, they want to be able to go in and have full API access and and all that, which we don't we don't have at this point. Um, which is fine, and they they our libraries have been okay with it, but it helps us determine what they get so that we can be very judicious about who is being included in those patron type data sets. We also only have two schools that are still um, on there, but we do have a correctional facility where that information is um, segregated from the rest of the database much more tightly. I'm not entirely sure the mechanism for that. So, of course, with my permissions, I can see everything. So I don't always remember what everybody else with less permissions can actually see. So, but they, they are hidden from the rest of the consortium. But their resource sharing is then also um, essentially non-existent. So 
we're planning to go to 3.9 in the fall. And the simple reporter does have some restrictions about only being able to export data for org units that are assigned to you, uh, which is a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what we're talking about, and we haven't, we, we're not gonna do it right away, but what we're talking about is then reducing the number of people who have full reporter access. Now, I don't think that would, we would probably not restrict the number of people who can view an output. Um, and uh, so it wouldn't prevent someone from necessarily forwarding something on, mm -hmm. um, but I think it could prevent like a potential accidental if you just, you know, you click the wrong org unit kind of thing. So we just started that conversation last week in Pennsylvania. And this is not a technical fix at all, but um, it, it's kind of a people, I don't even know that it's a fix. We have, we have a code of ethics for um, Evergreen Indiana that everybody who accesses the client is obligated to have signed it in their personnel file and then their director um, has to essentially say that they're all there and they have their own code of ethics. Obviously that doesn't mean that relies on the people to follow through with that, uh, which there's zero guarantee that that's actually going to happen, but it does at least put that in their mindset that it's an important thing to keep in mind. And I talk about it ad nauseum too, so. Ronald. Ronald. Yeah, we have a similar, uh thing to what you just described, that before anyone gets an Evergreen staff account, they have to sign an acknowledgement that it's private data, it's it's not public, that they'll handle it you know, correctly and all of that kind of thing. So that's an overarching. We don't really have, so we do have different levels of, of access, um, but uh, but that's the, the primary thing. We also have a warning on the, the staff portal, um, I think a couple other places that this is private information. Um, you know, just as a reminder in a yellow box uh, so that people um, see it uh, and know it. You know, we're just afraid. I mean, and it is something that the, the original acknowledgement that people signed and yes, kept on file and all of that kind of thing. Uh, so there's a little bit of honor there to it, but it is enforced by the, by the library directors. We're a multi-type consortium with 25 libraries, one school, uh, some colleges and 17 publics. Uh, so we share patron records, basically, the, uh, the school, it's a private school, puts in some shorter information, um, and, uh, but, but the information is, is, is still there. Uh, and we do allow an API for third-party authentication and that kind of thing. We require uh, the vendor sign uh, a statement there as well, um, acknowledging they keep it private, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's a policy. Before we allow any any third party vendor third party vendor access, uh, we require that signed statement. One of the things that we've count came so we also have sort of a patron pr uh, privacy policy, and then we mm -hmm. also um, put together a staff code of ethics. One of the things that we realize that the, is that the uh, code of ethics and having them sign off is really something between their HR department and them as an employee that we as sort of a consortia didn't really kind of have the authority to kind of, um, you know, say you have to do this. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we came across, you know, across as we discussed it. Um, but those are both things, I'll post those in the chat. We've got a link to those online. Um, but yeah, we ended up doing sort of a uh, code of ethics recommendation and then um, an actual privacy policy that talks about some more specifics. Um, one of the other things that we do for like uh, data feeds. Um, so if we have um, what we call student access accounts, which are feeds that are coming from the schools and we automatically generate uh, the accounts for people. So we have a couple of different things that we do there in terms of password protecting the um, Excel file, if they're sending that or doing something, we don't want them to send across data in, you know, uh, unsecured formats, you know, through email or that sort of thing. Uh, we don't have anything about report permissions, you know, as you guys have all mentioned, it's pretty much, we don't really, we haven't, we don't know of a way to kind of uh, strategically uh, address that, but would be interested in anything. Um, 
One of the things we do uh, is a, a regular sort of purge process of uh, dormant um, patron accounts. We um, uh, basically have uh, a, a form that people can fill out that uh, puts together some criteria and says, um, you know, if any of my patrons meet this criteria, then essentially what we do is mark them inactive rather than actually delete them. Um, so that's, we do that uh, kind of on an annual basis. We'll, uh, we'll do that for people, but I'd also be interested in any kind of developments around, um, limiting, you know, data access for some of the reporting things, because, you know, you can kind of essentially dump the patron data if you're so inclined. Other thoughts on this topic? My only thought is once there's an Excel spreadsheet that's been generated from the reporter, it is incumbent on whomever to keep it private. And of course you're talking about password protecting uh, documents, which is a great idea, especially if you're moving them, but also making sure that your workstation is password protected, that you're following all of those um, normal protocols for but again, that's not a technical fix. I mean, there are technical aspects to it that comes back to the character of the individual with that. And I think humanity has forever been trying to solve that. <laughs> you know, that kind of segues nicely into the next uh, uh, subject, which was account security. Um, you know, passwords, MFA, et cetera. Um, you know, what, uh, uh, Katie, is there, there, you wanted any further, um, questions or things that you want to add to that topic or, um, thoughts? Uh, yeah, this was something that, uh, had actually come up, I think at our, uh, consortial leaders round table in December. Uh, and we've just been sort of starting to talk about, we turned off the login of expired accounts. So that was our, that was our first big step. Um, we, and we also uh, removed the permission of anything but uh, global staff to actually delete accounts. So we're doing some retraining right now about, you do have to deal with your old staff accounts, do not delete them. Um, Cause you can't. So yes. we're, what we're kind of at the early stages of looking at this. And the, the first step is, blocking login of expired accounts and getting people to actually manage their staff accounts. Uh, so I'm just curious if other people are doing more than that. If so, what? And I am also, I think that we would be interested in development around multi-factor authentication. Uh, so just to throw that out there as something that uh, if other people are also interested in that, then maybe we should have a chat. I cannot say enough about the library setting to um, not allow logins for expired accounts. It ticked off so many of my librarians and usually I'm very reticent to tick people off in the consortium, but I thought this was def this was a hill to die on for sure yeah. because they were not actually managing their own staff accounts. And we, we cannot uh, physically do that for 130 libraries. And, and so, that was a lovely thing. There are also some specific um, account types that we actually manage centrally. So anybody with um, higher level cataloging responsibilities, local admins, um, we manage those centrally. Um, but we often there is it's a misperception, but we don't we do tell them that they they can manage it but we don't spend a whole lot of time so that we get a lot of questions about how they should be managing their staff accounts. And so every single time it's another learning opportunity for them to say, this is how you go in. You need to expire their account, change their password, do not delete this password or this account because they're all tied to transactions and things that, are, and maybe reports or, that are recurring or something like that. So they need to stay. There's a comment from Taryn in here 
that we also manage our top cat and admin roles centrally and require them to go through training first. Yes, exactly. We probably modeled what we do actually on Georgia Pines. So I feel pretty confident that we did. And it was a good thing to do. I'm curious about the multi-factor authentication, how you would see that playing out in the wild. Good question. Okay. Um, so, I, because I think what I would love to have would be multi-factor authentication for logins over a certain permission level. I, I would not love having it for cert clerks, but okay. I would love having it for um, higher permission levels. Or I, I guess not everybody's are called the same, but like the, the basic desk one, uh, whatever that's called in your consortium. So, um, there but then like how does that work with overrides and there's there's just a lot to consider there mm -hmm. um i think what what we would love to have between then and between now and and a, i mean that would be a big project to undertake having just pass a password strength requirement for staff would be great um and we will i will maybe calling you next june ruth because what we did is we bumped out everybody who'd logged in in the last six months until mm -hmm. next year and so that's when it's going to hit the fan for us oh yeah we, next year we're in june when everybody our, expires we're doing that with our local admins too because we're putting in place a um a certification requirement for them as opposed to what we say is a requirement but this way it will be tracked and and um, so we, we've pushed out their expiration dates. Thankfully, we have that now so that facilitates this, pushed out their expiration dates so that they have time to fulfill that annual training requirement that will be implemented. Um, so we're kind of in the same boat and we are doing that now with our uh, CAT 1s mm -hmm. where the way that it's set up is that they get three year um, expiration date. Well, it actually should only be two years because they have to have an annual training requirement in there and it gives the right buffer. So um, we had a lot of a lot of people um, at the beginning of 2022 who, despite the fact that we, I cannot tell you how much we publicize this in the consortium and still, got probably 50 help desk tickets saying, I don't know what happened. Evergreen is broke. I can't do anything. Da, 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 da. And I was like, well, your account has <laughs> expired. And in some cases, if it was somebody less than that permission level, it was just a matter of saying, this is what happens now. This is not a big deal. We have fixed it for you. Go forth and do your evergreen thing. Or if it was a director saying, go forth and, and do an audit of your staff accounts and see who's close to expiration and just fix them all. That's part of your, your yeah. role as the local admin. But for our cat ones and our local admin, it, it was a little bit longer of a conversation saying, there's a training requirement that you know about and you did not fulfill this is how you go about that. So we had a lot of people participating in those kind of last minute training opportunities and um, using our recordings and all sorts of things to get their uh, permissions back very quickly. And it worked and we, we don't have, I'm sure that there was grumbling behind the scenes in their organizations, but we don't hear any grumbling about it now. It was just kind of that almost, it was a little bit of a brute force thing, but I think that it was necessary um, to get people's attention because obviously emails and notices and announcements and things don't don't really always work, <laughs> as we know. We also turned on that uh, that setting to not allow expired accounts to log in. What we did as a follow up is we basically um, send out a quarterly message where we say these are the accounts that are going to expire, 
in the next, I think we say within a past month and within three months going forward to sort of give the, we have um, what are called system login access managers. And those are sort of our point people for each system that you all are the ones that take care of the staff accounts for your group and you're responsible for making sure that they're in inactivated and all that kind of stuff. So we send them a message on a quarterly basis saying, hey, here's who's about to expire. Make sure that they uh, renew their accounts and stuff. Uh, similar to some of what you all are saying, um, our item catalogers and bib catalogers don't have the ability to edit their own accounts. They can go mm -hmm. through my account on the OPAC and re change their password, mm -hmm. um, but they can't actually um, make changes to their own account. So we have to sort of do some of those things for them. Um, one of the things that we have uh, we're getting ready to roll out right now is a new process that requires um, uh, staff to change their passwords on a quarterly basis. So we uh, the, the way that we developed it is that a, a um, you can define according to permission group the criteria that has to have uh, the password has to have and um, pop up a message uh, to them when they log in to um, the staff interface for the first time and say, your password is, you know, 326 days old, you know, you need to change it, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so that's something we're getting ready to deploy here shortly. And we want to be able to sort of contribute that to the larger evergreen community. Um, you know, so that may be something that, that, um, you know, I'll, that's I'll, exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, but it doesn't address some of the things like, like, uh, you know, when you start thinking about MF MFA, you know, like, w can you change password on the fly, you know, override permissions, all that kind of stuff? Like, what does that look like? You know, Mickey, I was seeing you, you were saying that, um, you know, that does require a second, you know, you have to have something else where you can go and email account or whatever the case may be. And that, you know, that does add an additional layer of um, complication to doing that kind of stuff. You know, where do you, do you have everybody's email address? Do you have a phone number that they want to use? Do you know, how do you manage all that stuff? Um, Elizabeth is saying, uh, I'd be curious to hear about what training is required for those cat one and local admin perms. And I can send that email to anybody too. Uh, I'll put it. Good. I can send that email <laughs> to everybody that's in here. Okay. <laughs> We've got an administration manual. Maybe I'll send a link to that and uh, reply to your message and send a link to that. <clears throat> other folks, uh, other other um, perspectives on this? Uh, Joanne says, can I send that to the listserv? Yes, which list serve? Consortia leaders, is that okay. yes. all right, Joanne? I will do that. Perfect. Benjamin, would this apply to the branches that use a generic login? Yes, it would. This would be all staff accounts. We are moving hard, hard against generic logins, um, I, recognizing that they are definitely a convenience, especially at busy CERC desks. Um, but man, if there was a way. <laughs> to have everybody have their unique login, that would be great. We have multi-factor authentication for operating system logins. Staff have the option to use personal device for that or some hardware gets them. Yeah. What kind of logistical things have you dealt with in, in eradicating those in terms of, you know, sort of user experience things or, or um, pushback or, you know, how, how's that process been? It's a matter of, our, of the Pines team just saying, we're going to delete this, and so you need to sign up a different way. It's some of that sort of thing. And we've explained that it really is a security issue. We've talked about it for years, so they, they knew it was coming. And so, yeah, it's just a matter of us running those reports and seeing who's straggling along and then pushing them along on the spectrum. Ron's also saying at Noble they did the same thing. In all of our new libraries, we preach it as if it were gospel, even though we know that there are legacy libraries doing other things. And I'm working on a project, I just got an email from them today, where they've actually been using, it's gonna pain me to say this, 
they've been using their staff accounts for personal borrowing. And oh, so we're finally working on getting them. They're one of our first libraries. And so they came on when it was the Wild West, of course, and uh, stuck with that. And we, I think that they're probably the only library that does it with abandon in full view of everybody. Um, so we're working on <laughs> separating them out. So first of all, so that they have um, distinct public. Yes, <laughs> Jason, where things were different then. Uh, they have distinct staff accounts based on their roles. And yes, you know exactly what's up. Uh, and then their personal borrowing accounts. Um, so we'll we'll see. But I love the idea of that script that you or whatever you're doing. And I don't want to call it a script because I'm not sure uh, Benjamin and North Carolina to do that quarterly password reset and have that baked into the system. I think that that might address some of those those privacy. Um, issues because we know that lazy security is one of the things that can cause breaches in security. As soon as we have a launch pad, uh, launch pad bug associated with that, with more information, the you know, uh, patches and stuff, I'll share that with everybody. That'd be great. Um, and Rogan has here, just in case it's useful. Oh, it, that's multi-factor authentication. Cool. Oh, well, of course we're interested. <laughs> Are any of you setting standards for staff passwords, like requiring them to be a certain length or use, you know, characters and symbols and numbers? And do you enforce that on the database side at all? Or is it more just like, you know, best practice? We do in that in the tool that I was talking about, that is part of it. And in, in the settings, you can define per permission group what the regex for uh, the password uh, criteria needs to be. Um, so that is something that you can say that, you know, um, patrons can have a four digit password if they feel like it, but staff have to have a this, this, and that, and an admin has to have this, this sort of thing. So it's part of the, the way that uh, uh, Llewellyn developed the structure of, of that. So um, I, there may be a front end um, um, component to that as well in terms of in the actual uh, patron account form, um, but I forget exactly some of the logistics of that. Aaron says, we had staff ask, could they pick their own passwords? I made it simple and told them no, <laughs> but we had just mi migrated. You could, they can pick their passwords through the OPAC My Account feature, unless it's shut off for some in some way, but I doubt that it is. So Katie was mentioning in terms of the circulation um, that they prevented the login accounts from being able to circulate. We've done the same thing for ours. I, it got to be kind of problematic for us and I've implemented some higher level general policies since I came. Um, I, I think the, the lowest level you still can't circulate, but we have some use cases where if libraries are using materials, especially materials from other libraries for staff use, like for story time or whatever, then they wanted to be able to check it out to a staff account. And also the no, no match point found is not a useful error, uh, like in terms of knowing what you need to do different. So we don't have that as much as we used to, but that was how it was set up for a long time here. Jessica was mentioning 12 characters across the board for staff and patrons. Yeah, we've we've got a lot of people who have four digit passwords. You know, we had a, a journalist contact us one time saying that uh, their um, um, browser had told them that their password was part of a data leak. Um, because they had a very simple password. And so they contacted us and said, hey, did you guys, are you, you going to have a security issue? And of course we scramble and try to figure out what's going on. And then, you know, I said, what is the, what is the, the content of the message you're getting and that kind of stuff and realized that it was the Safari password manager or something like that was checking against sort of known exploits and that kind of stuff. And so it was his choice of a password uh, in his browser, you know, notifying him rather than it actually being, you know, a security incident, but it was, it was uh, uh, a case for not 
Make oh. your ears prick up. <laughs> yeah. So in going back to Katie's point about turning off the circulation, I would love that. But we do have a lot of our staff who are legitimately using circ functions um, in their staff account, whether they're placing holds for things they need to come back to cataloging or checking things out, even though I discourage this for programs, um, things like that. So we would get a lot of pushback from, from turning that off. A younger me would have been okay with it. An older me is less okay with the pushback. What we've done is set up a, a permission group called staff, and then we allow them to have a card that's a staff card, and that's sort of administered by their library and kind of can- Which we have that as well, um, but that's their personal borrowing account. They can also have other, there are many ways to get around this that are, but because we're not in charge of their local CERC policies and things like that, they're going back to kind of how you're handling the code of ethics, where we can actually say as part of our membership agreement, you have to do these certain things where you could only recommend it. We're kind of there in terms of these accounts as well, to a certain extent. And to actually offer staff cards in our consortium, their board has to approve that. Taryn is mentioning in the chat, we allow staff to use their staff uh, account for personal checkouts and consider it a perk for them since they don't get overdue fines on their staff cards. Is that separate from their work account though? Because we have a staff card that is essentially a patron profile. So it, it is the same thing. It's their working account that they're using for personal things. We're separating that because we've had people leave um, with stuff and they need to either be sent to collections or whatever, but we need to keep their transactions and things that they've done on behalf of the library um, separate and active for a certain extent. Cheryl saying even before going fine free, staff had to use their personal accounts to check out. Um, the older director was adamant that we had to behave as patrons for our personal checkouts. Um, and Taryn saying we still charge them if they don't return items. And that's the difference with our staff count is that it is a fine free, if they're not fine free libraries, it's a fine free account that has um, more privilege to it than just a, like a resident card. Taryn's also adding it's up to the local admins to change staff accounts to patron accounts when they leave. So I'm seeing we have about 15 minutes. Uh, this has been great. I think uh, last year uh, the conversation uh, wasn't as as uh, 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 as easy to. I think don't think we could have as many people involved or something like that. But um, it's really great to have the 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 uh, dialogue. Uh, we have one more uh, topic of uh, conversation here, which is consortium governance. Um, how are decisions made in your consortium? which decisions require a vote from every member library and which are made by the board of directors? That's a great question. Generally, if it affects our committees, if it, so if it is a committee election um, or if it's something that affects our bylaws, then that goes to a full council, which is a representative from each library. If it's something that has to do with um, policies and procedures, then it's our executive committee. And then we have subcommittees, cataloging, patron services, and e-content that they vote to make recommendations to the executive committee to vote on. And the executive committee is in charge. I recommend to them and they tell me what I can do. At Noble, anything, uh that charges the libraries, the budget, the assessments uh, are decided by all the libraries. We were 501c3, we, we get a small amount of state funding, 10 or 12%, but most of it is billed out to, to the actual libraries. Um, as well as policies, particularly interlibrary policies for resource sharing, for data entry, for all of that kind of thing. And some of those get into a little bit of, of recommended procedure. Um, 
uh, just to be clear, uh, but uh, but anything of, of that higher level um, gets gets voted on by by all the directors and the, the kind of the day to day working within the existing budget and and appropriating reserve funds and all of that kind of thing is is up to the board and populating committees and setting up committees and that kind of thing is up to the board. Could I be specific about what Diane's request concerns? Yeah. Sure. This is about a conversation we had recently concerning how we um, have chosen in the past, and we're a 10-year-old um, consortium of 60 public libraries, how we've chosen to show the, the holds Q position for patrons. Um, as you know, it's a meaningless number because the holds Q is affected by a number of factors um, that are complicated, uh, and, and most libraries uh, choose to turn that off uh, that I've worked with in the past. They just don't have any interest in that. But we have a few legacy libraries that have trained their patrons to um, look at that holds position number. And unfortunately, many um, patrons have locked on to that as something like a lifeline in terms of <laughs> what, what, when they're going to get their stuff. Um, and so although the committees in charge of this and our support vendor and everyone has weighed in on this, um, there are still one or two libra that, that we'd like to hide it in the catalog. We have a shared catalog um, that uh, there are a few libraries that object. And the objection is based on the principle that um, these decisions need to be made um, in a democratic fashion, and there should be a group vote on these kinds of issues. Um, my position as the new executive director since January and um, will continue to be that, um, just as Ruth said, um, these kinds of issues, I think, need to go through the committee and just as we have uh, go to the executive committee and, and, and ultimately to the executive board if necessary. But I don't believe there are things that need to be voted on by uh, general membership. So I'm very interested in everyone's views on this particular subject. It, a, a lot of it, I think, would depend on how your bylaws are written, um, which there should be. And if there isn't, there sh that should be addressed. There should be something in there that fairly explicitly states what the purpose of the council vote is. Council in our, and I should say, for us, the council is all of the libraries. Um, what constitutes the necessity for that and when is it held? We generally only hold council votes once a year unless there is a an emergency, which there hasn't been an emergency in my that that goes to that level in in my knowledge. Honestly, it could have happened and I've forgotten because I'm getting there. But but the other things um I mean, our, our committees are all representatives from our member libraries. And something like that would probably be uh, something that was discussed in our patron services committee, um, and which tends to be more of our um, circulation staff, people who are hearing from patrons a lot and would uh, have that conversation maybe do some more research on that, make a recommendation to the executive committee who would go through a similar process to get feedback and things like that. And then they, they would make a determination and that would go into policy or instruction. I'm not sure that that necessarily is a policy that that's a turn a thing off because we said turn that thing off. And this is why we said it and and we're representing you, OU libraries. But your bylaws have to get have to provide you the support for that. Yeah, for for us, um, our, the, our executive committee has the power to make decisions on, on certain things, and they are spelled out in the bylaws. Um, they do send things to the users' meeting. So in this case, this would go to the full membership. Um, we do meet four times a year and we do do majority votes. So we've had some things like anonymization, when to anonymize CERC data. Our CERC committee wanted to keep it a lot longer than some of the directors who really were concerned about privacy issues. And so that went to the full membership. We had a lot of discussions, a lot of people weighed in. 
um, but the majority vote was to anonymize data after you know uh, two weeks of it being returned and there no being no fines and anything in the system. So the the discussions are often very interesting, but most everything for us that's policy wise or that affects all the libraries do go for a full membership vote, and consensus is always a challenge on some things where there's very strong opinions either way. Um, so, but that's kind of how we're structured. By majority, do you mean like like uh, fifty one percent or 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 more? Yeah, we need a quorum, which is thirty three percent um, in attendance, and then it's a majority vote for for a quorum. So, and with one hundred and fifty five, fifty six libraries, um, you know, it's. We usually do meet, meet the quorum <laughs> at the meetings, but it it's they've been better attended over Zoom just because of the logistics of traveling mm -hmm. to a meeting in a consortia, you know, our physical size. So and ours is fifty percent participation for a quorum and then fifty-one percent for the majority vote of that quorum. We have a governance committee and the governance committee sort of helps decide issues that are have an impact on everyone. We do the things that, uh, you know, we also, they will a lot of times, you know, like consult with the directors and we'll have surveys and sort of find out what the pulse of the, the directors are. Um, you know, so for instance, we implemented a, a change in our fee structure uh, a couple of years back, and that was something that, you know, we sort of presented some things and talked to the governance committee, and then they said, we want to hear what the uh, director said, and then they made the decision as to which, which you know, plan to go with. Um, the only things we really have the full vote on are bylaw changes and who is on the governance committee. Um, so that kind of helps us, um, you know, Mickey, one of the things that comes to mind with that stuff is that it does have a negative um, user experience impact, you know, like if it isn't a real number and uh, they are expecting it to be a real number and get upset because it's not a real number, you know, that, that has a, you know, detrimental effect on the sort of perception of, you know, how you do what you do. Quite right. And I think that argument has been uh, put forward pretty clearly. Uh, we still have members who feel that that is something they'd like to retain uh, for their reasons. And, um, you know, if we need to go to full membership vote, of course, we will. But I think the question is, where do you draw the line on uh, these kinds of catalog details, these kinds of things? And we're pretty clear on governments, fee structure, all that stuff. Obviously, we want to go to our members for important questions. But questions that have to do with general usability of the catalog, the kind of particulars, uh, um, again, I, I, I would seek out other specific examples from you to see where we might find some guidance that would be useful. One of the things that I said to my board, uh, we have a kind of arcane governance structure that's very well laid out in our bylaws about how the voting takes place, it says nothing about what needs to be voted on. So one of the, so there, there's this whole, whole thing for who comprises the users group and who gets a vote and how many votes they get. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't say what's majority doesn't say what they need to vote on. So one of the things that I, that I said to my board was, you know, I want input from users. The, the board of the 501c3 makes decisions about the business operations of the 501c3, but you hired me and I hired my team to make development decisions, software decisions, security decisions, based on feedback, but also on our knowledge, experience, knowledge of what else is going on in the community, knowledge of what's available. And I don't think it, any of that should be a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I said, you know, we, we have this in our bylaws and if we need to take things to a vote, then we will do that. But me, as the executive director that you hired, this is what I think. So we'll, we'll see how it unfolds. We're, we're doing some bylaws review right now, so we'll see couple of things in the chat. Um, Ruth was saying our executive committee is comprised of nine members with three representatives from each small, medium, and large library systems. We have a similar sort of thing. Uh, S-T-O-L. Oh, I, I put comprised two, and it should be of. So oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. And Cheryl was mentioning... Cheryl was mentioning when we were going through consolidating a massive list of patron profiles, which 
uh, we did a couple of summers ago. It was one vote per system to keep or toss all in the room together at our annual meeting. Um, so that was our way of sort of consensus building. We are going to be um, looking at expanding, extending our membership tier structure um, to accommodate larger expending libraries. And um, it's going to be kind of a multifaceted thing. Uh, so our executive committee is um, standing up a working, an ad hoc working committee that involves uh, some of our the directors from our larger systems, since they will be impacted, and then um, a, a call out for whoever else is interested that are going to work on something to propose to the executive committee, who will then decide whether or not they're going to send that to our annual meeting um, for a full council vote, because it will, um, it will change structurally parts of our consortium. And so it needs to go through just about every level of consensus building that we can um, manage. So it also so, is a rollout for like two years. <laughs> so would that be different sort of voting power for different size libraries, something along those lines? Uh, not really, um, because in the end, I mean, it is the council, there's one vote per library system. So you could almost say that the smaller libraries have more voting power. They definitely do per capita, which is why we wanna have the larger libraries um, really involved in the initial discussion to make those um, proposals. So we have consensus there when we get down to what is truly democratic thing um, that doesn't take into account any of that. I will, it, it's going to be a thing. I'm not sure the membership tiers uh, were explained there, how much your library, yes. Yeah, so we have a tiered membership fee, uh, fee structure based on annual expenditures for our libraries. And um, there's actually a calculation, it's a little bit more intricate than just your annual expenditures. But uh, so we have some libraries that pay nothing and then we have some libraries that pay significantly more than nothing. But we have some libraries that should actually probably be paying significantly more than the significantly more than they're paying. So. We have a pretty complicated ratio that is based on how we distribute state aid, but it's kind of the opposite of how we distribute aid. And it has to do with per capita income per service population area and all this kind Ooh. of stuff. So it, fortunately the numbers are already run for me. I just have to it's plug them all in. Yay, but. spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so uh, looks like we are approaching the end of our time. Um, any further thoughts on uh, some of these topics? You Good know, luck, Vicki. <laughs> As a new executive right? director. Thank you so much for everybody's input. You know, one of the things that I just wanted to leave you all with as sort of a thought for the continuing conversations and that sort of thing, um, you know, is is kind of what kind of challenges is your organization facing and how might this group of people be able to help you think through um, approaches for strategy and sort of opportunities and options and that sort of thing, you know, as it's, it's um, I've really benefited, I feel like personally from uh, being able to connect with this group on a regular basis and sort of having the opportunity to kind of bounce these ideas around as we welcome new peers into this sort of um, group of people, you know, how can we help to orient them to sort of some of the things that they're responsible for doing? Um, how can we kind of uh, encourage them and in, in sort of getting grounded and figuring out what they're doing and how to 
uh, uh, make sense of the, the complexity of what they're addressing. So, um, yeah, just want to uh, encourage you to think about that. And I welcome uh, and look forward to seeing uh, you all again in the quarterly meetings and such. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation today. Um, a couple of last little things here. Thank you, everyone, for a lovely discussion. Thanks for facilitating your thing. Uh, thank you, everyone, interested and helpful. Uh, informative. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Thank you. All right. Cool. And thanks, Ben. <laughs> From <laughs> your monitor. Thanks, thanks, Ben. <laughs> all right. We will see you all uh, soon enough.